Welcome to the Sci-Fi Sci, a podcast about black science fiction, fantasy, and staying on the same page with being ass. I'm one of your amazing co-hosts, Amber Wallen. And I'm Ben's ass. And Ben's ass. Ben, my lips is dry. I hope we can get through this whole thing. But we're going to round out spooky season today with two uh, movies. I was about to say incredible movies, but we we feel a ways about one of the movies, I know. Both of the movies that we're discussing today are directed and starring black actors, writers, producers. So we just want to highlight that as we round out spooky season. The first movie we'll be discussing is Black Box, directed by Emmanuel Osei. Kufour Jr. The second movie that we'll be discussing is Bad Hair, directed by Justin Simeon. I do want to say right off the top, there will be so, so, so many spoilers. We're recapping the whole movie, dismembering all the ins and outs. We're, we're dissecting, if you will. I tried to do something bloody. No? That didn't work? What, why, why are you looking at me? I just, just so you know at home, Ben is rolling his eyes looking at me. But yeah, we're just going to get all up in the guts and blood and goodiness, goriness of both of these movies. The first one that we'll be talking about is Black Box. If you haven't seen Black Box, you can act, you can pause right now and access it on Amazon Prime. But now we're going to get into the spoilers. Since we're on the topic of horror, we've been talking a lot about different kinds of horror representation. And Robin Coleman writes in Horror Noir of two different kinds of black horror. She talks about blacks in horror, which is simply having a story in which black people are a part of it, but not centering blackness and not having black creators. And then she talks about black horror, which is having black creatives and directors, writers, all all that. And the funny thing about Black Box is that it's black actors, black writers, black director, but right off the bat, it didn't feel like a black movie. Mm-mm. And it didn't. yeah, and why? Go for it, Amber. Why didn't why didn't it feel like a black movie? For for so many reasons, it I, the writing felt very whitewashed for me personally, and, and we will say some things we enjoyed about it later. But the the writing was very whitewashed. All the names of the characters were very whitewashed. For context, this film was put together by so many incredible, not only just like Black Americans, but also uh, lots of African creators. The director. Emmanuel Osei Kufour Jr., his parents are from Ghana, so he's Ghanaian. The main actor, Mamadou, he's Martanian, I want to say, is the name of the country. I'm probably mis- mispronouncing something, but he's Martanian. And then the one of the lead doctors in the movie, he is Nigerian. So you have three different African countries represented here. And I don't know, for, for some reason, I thought there would be, I don't want to make it a minstrel show or anything, but jokes about different Jolof Rices and different sort of representations as far as dress, as far as the naming of the characters, as far as how the characters existed and navigated the world. And even the daughter in the movie, she went to a school where, and the school had all white students and all white teachers at car riders. The houses in the neighborhood had a very white feel to them. The, the dialogue was very white. There were no black musical transitions throughout the movie. There were just lots of signs that this was not a black story. So to name some of the people that were a part of the process in creating a movie as far as actors, directors, writers, was Mamadou Athi, a black national treasure, Felicia Rashad, Amanda Christine, Tosin Morahun Fola, Charmaine Bengua, Troy James, and Donald Elise Watkins. Watkins is black as hell, right? And then the casting names of the characters were Nolan, Lillian, Ava, Gary, Miranda, and Thomas. Those were the names of the characters in the movie. Did you hear that distinction between those the people who created it versus the people who were in it? It shows that... I guess, like, we don't live in a post-racial society. Right. And I remember we were reading some interviews by this, and Jay Ellis, who was the producer who's um, in Insecure, uh, he was saying that he wanted to sort of make a movie where you didn't have to deal with race or something like that. Yeah, he was like, "What, what, what would happen if our imagination didn't have to deal with racial barriers? And it's like, well, that's Afrofuturism. So show me, show me 
blackness as the priority and blackness driving and and navigating the space because if if that was true you wouldn't have had white characters in the background of this movie if you didn't have to think about racial barriers well yeah but even when you read afrofuturism i'm thinking of the novel midnight robber by nalo hopskinson even in this like almost post-racial world, like first of all, a lot of the characters are black and they're bringing Caribbean culture in their space travel. So even if you're dealing with Afrofuturism and there's not racism, you're still bringing part of that culture with you. And so there's always remnants, even thinking like even today, you know, thousands of years ago, or when we have Greek culture, like that's still part of our culture today, even though Greek problems are not really our problems today, part of that culture is still part of our culture. So you might not even have like a race, like racism, but even in a a post-racial culture, you're going to have references to cultural artifacts that grew up in racism. I so agree. And I hate this notion that racial racializing things is a burden. I I feel like in the article that in the shadow and act article that we read where he was talking about it, it's like, well, we didn't, we wanted to imagine a movie where we didn't have to deal with racial barriers. It's like, well, yes, you, you didn't have to show racial violence and you didn't have to show discrimination, but there is a way to acknowledge blackness and uplift that that just was not done here. And that's not a burden. It just isn't. I don't know. Maybe a lot of African people feel the pressure to be like, oh, well, you want this big kente cloth of a work of art. And I just want to like work on something. Like, why do I have to infuse all of that in there? But I I think this might be some work I need to do. But as a black American, I, I am so jealous that it's like, you know, which African country that you are from. And there's so much power in that. And I am jealous. I I truly just want to see that story just a little bit to feel that connectedness. One day when I discover what African country I'm from, I'll, I'll leave all of these other countries alone or whatever the fuck but there's something there's a jealousy in me knowing when I see like someone's like I'm Nigerian I'm Liberian I'm Ghanaian and so I'm like okay I want to see I truly just want to learn those distinctions between those countries and those cultures like I truly want to learn and observe and research and I guess I mean that's not their job they're like bitch go google it but I don't know. I was just looking for some of that since this was such a a diaspora of influence with this movie. It, and it, it was just so whitewashed. Well, it, it was as if these characters were fully assimilated into mm-hmm. American culture. And the, the lack of black was which, unsettling. <laughs> which itself, yeah, well, which itself is like a, that is a, a racist idea. So even when this movie is trying to attempt of like dealing with racial barriers, it still does. Mm-hmm. Yes, have, it still does that by erasing backstories of the actors, even the through giving them characters that don't reference anything re- revolving around black culture. The story is about this man, Nolan who has gotten to a really bad car accident, and the result of that is he has lost his memory, and his wife has died, and so now he has to raise his daughter, Ava, on his own. And he is struggling. He does get support from his friend, Gary, and Gary suggests him to do this sort of alternate treatment through this mysterious uh, doctor named Dr. Lillian. And... Uh, Nolan gets this treatment from this new doctor that he goes to essentially get his memories back. And it's the treatment is a mixture of like Oculus virtual reality and hypnosis. And the movie sort of trans, you know, transpires from there. The movie turns into it's an amnesia movie. And then at the end, you find out it's a mind transference movie. And so the big spoiler at the end is the doctor has actually transferred her son's mind into Nolan's. So Dr. Lillian has her son, Thomas, who she's downloaded into Nolan's mind prior to the movie taking place after Nolan first got into his car accident and, and died. So Nolan has lost his memory, but he's really not Nolan. He's actually Thomas. 
And so sort of the last third of the movie, Thomas discovers that he's not Nolan, he's actually Thomas and the story, that's sort of the, the big, the big twist. Uh, so it's a mind transference slash amnesia movie. And we, I love amnesia movies, like the Jason Bourne, the first Jason Bourne movie. And there's so much, so many stories you can tell with amnesia movies. I also love mind transference movies and also this idea of like downloading your consciousness into a virtual reality which is like a big part of Westworld. So there was uh, there was a lot of things you could do with this, especially using like African American history as a foundation. But they don't they don't take it that 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 place at all. Yeah, not at all. So again, you have two black men who have died. Nolan dies in the car crash. Thomas dies from falling down the stairs. What's also interesting is that these two black men. One is just like this really upstanding like great father he's a photographer he seems to be this amazing husband and then the other dr brooks's son thomas he abuses his wife and daughter so these two different personalities are now like vying for the same brain in the same body i want to get back to trying to you know imagine a world without racial barriers and things of that nature you can't do things like that when you star the black national treasure Felicia Rashad in a movie. You can't because she is Claire Huxtable and you and you chose her for a reason. And I, I was reading one article where they said, well, we wanted Claire, we, you know, everyone sees Felicia Rashad as Claire Huxtable, this like great TV mom from the Cosbys. So we wanted to give her a role where she could be the villain. And it's like, well, she was still a mom. She, she was still, and she was dri- driven by love. I mean, was she even really the villain? Like, was was what she did crazy? She was basically Claire Huxtable three thousand. Like, don't don't tell me that you want to sh- showcase Felicia Rashad in this completely different light, and she's still a mom, and and her motherhood is what was the driving motivation. Yeah, and they don't really explore familial relationship with her son. All you know is that that's her son, and she wants to save him. And which is so Claire Huxtable. Oh, I mean, I I never watched the Cosby aye, Show. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. That's okay. All right, so I, I do love like science fiction that deals with like big ideas, and you have like a bunch of different ideas of mind transference. So the one like mind transfer you can do is like taking the brain out and putting it into a new body, which is what Get Out is. Okay. Oh, right. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right? Yes. Like, that's one form of mind transference. Really, I love that idea, right? You just take the whole brain out and put it into a new, into a new, like, suit. And you're suit. just walking around in that new skin suit. Gotcha. Yeah, or like a sleeve. And altered carbon, same thing. And so that's one way. Another way is that you, like, somehow just switch the consciousness, which is that Futurama episode. So you don't remove the brain, you just take like the consciousness it has formed its own thing and so you find to electrically take that and transfer it so you don't remove the brain itself gotcha which is a little different and then finally there's like the black mirror idea in which is this movie falls into that where you remove the consciousness but the remnant of the previous person is still in there mm-hmm. right and black there's a black mirror episode called black museum where mm-hmm. you're actually sharing that body. So you have, like, the main driver, the person walking around making most of the decisions, but then there's that little person as well in the background who can look through, like, a window yeah. and still have conversations with the primary controller. Which, I, I mean, that's sort of where the conflict in this film arises. Mm-hmm. Because once uh, Thomas realizes that he's been put into Nolan's body he also realized that there's this like remnant of Nolan left over yes fighting to get out and that that conflict actually is is probably the strongest point of that because it is and it's creepy it is what makes it horrifying right I don't think it would be horror without that like very dismembered contortionist 
conscious, trying to come back to life. Which, all those movements are real. There's a, a person named Troy James. Who, Troy James, yeah, yes. He, he's the main star of this film. Uh, he's a body contortionist. And he, has, he I was reading a little bit about his story. Because he used to be able to move so weird, he was just, like, nervous, and he thought people would make fun of him. But now that's his, like, full-time job. Like, he's of leaned into that. Of course it is. get paid to be yourself. Yeah, so that was cool, but in the... His role is, like, the backwards man. Mm-hmm. And so every time, like, N- Nolan slash Thomas goes under and... Like, to the sunken place. To the sunken place, mm-hmm. like, using... Actually, it's called... They're actually using an Oculus headset. Uh, <laughs> so once he goes into this Oculus headset, he keeps on being interrupted by um, the contortionist, the contortionist, body. which is Nolan's true self trying to like fight his way out, mm-hmm. and he like crawls out. It's really creepy. There's like mm-hmm. this bone cracking, cracking yes. sound effect, which is done r- very effectively. So that that conflict i i enjoyed but those were sort of the checkpoints for me to like stay awake Mm -hmm. because the movie you know sometimes movies are trying to be like slow and do this dramatic build-up but there was a point where i think you and i were like okay when is this gonna end like we we know what's happening now and so the contortionist was the checkpoint for like okay we're halfway there and then we see them again okay we're we're almost there like every time the the body person came through i was like okay we're we're slowly they're trying to build the suspense here, so let's let's get this over with. <laughs> is what I was kept thinking. And they also tease like this important like medical ethical question of like taking people off life support mm-hmm. because the whole story begins because Nolan has gotten into this car accident and Doctor Lillian has decided to take him off life support because he's essentially he's basically brain dead and transfer her son's uh, conscience into Nolan's body. But he wasn't brain dead, as we later find out, and that's the big twist at the end of the movie. He just, he, you know, he wasn't still alive. It makes me think of... He just had to find his way back. (laughs) That's, that's it. I mean, I just, I just made me think about our relationship and, like, when, when you would pull the plug on me, you know? (laughs) Like if something happened to you? Yeah, like what, what level of consciousness i know you really like me like massaging your feet like if i couldn't do that anymore do i lose my ability to live i'm sorry so you're asking me when you get old and can no longer serve me with the little things should i pull the plug on your life or you're asking if i was in a car accident both both i'm asking well that's kind of up to you i personally feel like when I've reached the age where, like, I can't go to the bathroom by myself, just take me out. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's a serious that's a serious question, I think, that people have to uh, think about and, and come to terms with. Remember that Terry Schiavo case in elementary school? Mm. It, it was the huge... It was, like, the biggest thing. I think I do. I remember as... Because it was, like, the husband wanted to pull the plug, but the family didn't or something? Right. And I don't think he would... I don't think they were married. I think... That oh yeah, I think it was her. And boyfriend. she had like a lot of money or something. Yeah, but she she had like lost. You know, she was like a vegetable. Yeah, that's that's but that's that's a that's really problematic language. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's like very because a vegetative state. But even even better? no no because even when you're in that state, as this movie shows, mm-hmm. there's like still a remnant of the self, like a contortionist trying to get out. Yeah. <laughs> and the movie... I think that's really problem. <laughs> like, if you were going to go to somebody's bed, it's like, I know there's a contortionist in there getting out because I saw a movie called Black Box. You're still in there. And, and you pat the person's head. <laughs> oh, my God. You're the worst. I mean, this we're giving this movie way too much credit. We are. It's like, if you got some time, if you're on a date that and there's too much energy happening... Put this movie on to mellow things out. Oh, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the great thing. Uh, Nolan, as the actor, has a really strong relationship with his daughter Ava. And oh man, Ava carried the movie on her back. Yeah, it's yeah. Ava is just very dynamic and adorable, and she helps out. She's like what, like third, fourth grade, and so 
And they and I love movies with actual child actors. And she was acting. Yeah, she phenomenal acting. And there was a mo there's a moment which I wish the movie took it a little bit further, but I don't know how much because I can't watch movies where children are like actually endangered. That just mm. it bothers me as, as a teacher. I, I get like stressed. I get really stressed uh, or. Or, like, when you watch, like, true crime where, like, children... You know having, I love my true crime. When, yeah, but when children are murdered, I'm just, like, I don't know. It just... When I don't love... I'm just kind of, like, what what went wrong in a person's life where they felt they had to throw their daughters down in a gas tank? What what the hell is going on? Exactly, yeah. You can't do it. I sure, I, I... Sure, I, I get the, the appeal of true crime. I understand. I just can't do it. But there's a point where uh, Thomas realizes that he... Um, is transferred in Nolan's body. So he's like, I'm going to no longer try to integrate into Nolan's life, which was a cool like moment, a big happening. So Thomas decides to go back to his wife and his kid. And basically abandon Ava. And, for and, and abandon Ava because he has no connection with Ava. Like literally, they don't know each other at all. And there's a moment where he gets really aggressive and yells at Ava, and I thought that they were going to take it to a point where he, like, hit her. And later we find out that the reason that Tom- Thomas died is because he kicked his daughter and his wife pushed him down the stairs. Mm-hmm. And I wish they just, uh, like, explored more of that, because Thomas is, like, this abusive asshole. But because he's in Nolan's body and sort of Nolan's characteristics is sort of vying. It's almost as if they created a new person. And that, they, that third. That third, right? Because that, that theory of like uh, psychology and when you have a relationship with someone, you actually are forming a third conscience. And I wish, I wish they like took it there that Thomas and Nolan actually like merged together to form a new person. But the movie ends with Thomas like being sucked into the Oculus headset and Nolan fighting and gaining control over his body. Or, I mean, Thomas made that decision. Thomas right. was like, you know what? I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm not a good person, which I don't think would it be what would happen at all. Cause, cause also Thomas and this story of domestic violence is actually a little bit more complex because, you know, typically for domestic violence, we see some sort of like rugged, not ambitious guy who is just very deeply insecure and so he abuses his partner and in this story Thomas is this like you know he's a med school student he's thriving but he also he grew up with privilege his mom up with is privilege, a doctor which is very I, I like that they did that because I think there's always this notion that domestic violence only exists in like impoverished communities and things like that so I like that they were like no even in this like medical and wellness community like people can still be assholes but I do not think that a man who wanted a second chance at life was an extreme narcissist and an abuser would make the decision to be like you know what no I'm gonna let this good person go live his life and I'm gonna fall to the side like it didn't and, check and that, out. that didn't check out at all I would have I would have preferred that Nolan like I, I want, I wish that Nolan was had this like huge moment where he like rise up and fought and and took it over, but he did it. He was getting his ass beat, and Thomas had a and, moment of and, like in the subconscious. There, there's the like subconscious. there's like this battle that happens in the subconscious, which is like pretty gritty, and Thomas ends up like beating the shit out of Nolan. Um, and then he just stops. And, and then it's he, like, wow, you are a good person. Should, like, when and ever has someone been beating someone up and been like, you know what? I'm a bad person. And you're a good person. So I should stop beating you. I wish. I guess they they trigger it, Ava. A, they, he hears Ava calling mm-hmm. for her for her father. But it, it, I, I also want to say, lastly, before we move on to the next, because, again, there's not much to say. This, this movie has 76% on Rotten Tomatoes, and we're kind of scratching our heads about I mean, fuck Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head about that, because I just feel like that rating is way too high. Love me some fine-ass Jay Ellis and everybody on board. Always here for black creators and black actors, but it simply was not a black narrative. And so I can't, I cannot in good faith give it a 76%. But in the last scene, you know, we've been waiting. The, the movie's so slow to build. We've been waiting for this, like, epic battle, uh, not just fisticuffs, but in the dialogue as well. And 
The line that just had me burst into laughter is, so Dr. Gary is confronting this other doctor, Dr. Lillian, for, you know, her misuse of her practices. And he's, he comes up to her face and says, you took an oath. And I was like, huh? That We've been waiting. We've been waiting 90 minutes for you to roll up in her face and say, you took an oath. Like, that's not how that goes. Like, you brought my brain dead friend out of a coma for your own selfish purposes to download your son's consciousness into my friend's body, I think I would have way more to say than you took an oath. The writing is so jaded. I would say more to a manager at a Chili's too. Who wrote it? Steven someone who is a black man. The, the whole movie felt like they had, you know, Toni Morrison talks about like the white man sitting over your shoulder when you're writing things and creating things. It felt that way. It felt like you wrote this for white audiences. You wrote for this to be a little bit more palatable. Well, they 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 reference Bobby Brown one time, and then they reference like digital voodoo, which are like two two like uniquely Black American sort of like references. Yeah, I, I guess there should have been something there. Well, well, you were saying that if Thomas originally like jumps out of the body, first of all, like once Thomas realizes he's in Nolan's body, he's not as like shocked as you would have thought. He's pretty, yeah. he's on board pretty quickly. And you're like, well, why didn't we discuss like, mom, how could you like, why did you choose this guy's body to download me? in? And there was like, I mean, you know, y'all are both branded or whatever. I was just like, no, you're both black with the same bit. Like say something. Or even the fact that, you know, doctors have been experimenting on, uh, black folk and, and black men. Yes. Like, trad- like that is a... Talk that, about that that's medical American, apartheid. Talk that's about American, it. That's an American tradition, and they don't touch on that or explore that at all. Over and, it. Hey, if you were Rotten Tomatoes, what would you have given this movie? I, I would say a 50%. Yeah. I would give it 50%. I, I may, I'm glad that the movie exists. I love movies like these. Like, I could talk about these movies. I think the movie did have some cool things to say the fact of like that the movie had some cool things to say about battling underneath the subconscious to what extent do we like keep someone on life support can we actually download our consciousness into a virtual reality there were things that the movie had to say points were made but it wasn't entertaining to watch you want to move on to the next movie yeah i'm excited about this next one this next one got snubbed this next movie is bad hair and I could easily see someone s- saying that this is one of their favorite movies. Yeah. It, it could easily become like... A cult classic. Yeah, a cult classic. I and love uh, it. it uh, my overall impression was it is a... Mon- it's like a creature feature, so a monster film. And the monster in here is like the coolest shit ever. I, I love... I, I think that... Th- I hope this starts like a whole... A whole weave or wave uh, of uh, oh god of vampire Cringe. of vampire <laughs> hair stories. Yes, it was so good and it was so black. So going back to your original point, like there's two types, right? Blacks in horror and black horror. This was black horror. Give us a, give us a recap. I, I'm so excited about this movie. Bad hair is about Anna who is living the dream trying to make it inside of TV, and she is an assistant for a producer at this MTV type of programming called Culture. And Culture has a turnaround, and she gets a new boss, and she is forced to sort of change her appearance by getting a new weave, going from, like, natural hair to a new weave. And turns out that new weave is this blood-sucking monster that uh, (laughs) propels her upwards in the TV industry, but also takes quite a bit of life as well. (laughs) Literally. Yeah, that weave gave him life and death. It was great. All right, so I I really do hope, as I said before, that this movie inspires, like, more hair horror. I'm here for it. And I, and I, I could already imagine someone, like, having this idea... And then being like, oh, bad hair came out. But so here's my problem with so much of like horror, traditional like horror films that or non-black horror films is that people will be like, oh, I can re I can remake the thing and I can remake all these, you know, vampire stories, blah, 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 where I think this 
you could, we could get more of this. Like, there can be, like, vampire hair stories. There's lots of vampire hair stories told in many, many different ways. In the same way that there's lots of amnesia movies and lots of mind transference movies. And you can put these, like, little twists and um, mess with the edges a little bit and, and brush them out a little bit. Oof. And It's lay the edges, Ben. Lay the edges. You don't mess with edges, you lay them. Oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Right, precisely. Which is why more of these stories need to be made. I thought this was so refreshing, and it was also fun. It, it wasn't super scary. Like, there were some parts that I, was, I, I jumped once or twice, but it was genuinely a really solid film. I It got a lot of criticism, and I was like, well, we're seeing new actors. We're seeing Kelly Rowland and Usher, but they're not, like, but they're not the focal point of the movie. They're... They're there, but they're not, like, hogging up. You know, I just hate when they take people that are already celebrities and try to put them in the movie. And unless they do it, like, really, really well, it kind of flops in a way. Uh, it was such strong performances from this entire cast. It was funny. It, I was here. For, there were a couple of parts in the movies that dragged, but it also centered around, like, some slave and African folklore, which was refreshing because those stories are, you know, those... You know, we're reading another book right now about those, like, bruh rabbit versus bruh fox. Like, all of those tales are super black and super important to black American and black African stories. So, I, I just thought that that was refreshing as well, that the moss-haired girl folklore and how that worked into the story. Or that was the story. Also, this film was really... It was really well filmed. I mean, the the set design was super nice. The, the lens and that they used was great, and the the fashion, the '90s fashion, was just like a, a step in the time machine. Really well done. Also, not only the fashion was a lot of fun, but the cre- like the creature effects are really campy and B movie quality, which I love. Like, What's B movie? Booty movie is just, like, small budget. Uh, so when you have a small budget, you have to be, like, very creative in how you do your special effects. And so instead of doing everything CGI, you might, like, have a scene and where um, you, you, you know, smash someone's head in, but you've created this person's head using, like, um, cake and ice cream. And, and, so, <laughs> and so there's, like, these really terrible cut shots where they cut the hair, like the hair has turned into this monster, and they cut the hair, and the hair, like, spouts blood and stuff. And that's, like, done not in CGI, but actual, like, sp- like spraying, like, yeah. like juice blood. <laughs> I, I, it, so it's, like, student film. Yeah. esque Yeah. But, but it was such a well done story. It was, it was nice to see people in different roles. I know that like Lena Waithe provided a lot of comedy in this. And I've, we've seen Lena Waithe as a comedian and other things before, but she, she was so refreshing in those last scenes of the movie because Lena Waithe sort of served as like what every black person in the theater would be saying. It's like, Rob, what, what? Now, why would you go back in there? Like all of that stuff was really fun. I also love that. So to back up, everyone gets these very expensive weaves from a salon called Virgie's. Virgie, it was played by Laverne Cox, which was also great because we've seen Laverne Cox as a hairdresser in Orange is the New Black, but she, here she, it wasn't and there's a trans woman that runs the shop. It's like, she's just a woman. This is her shop. But she's also diabolical. But she's also a witch. Shit. Yes. It, it was, that was refreshing to see. Um, and so at the end of the movie, I know the, the part I cackle that is Lena Waithe is not possessed by this hair because she didn't go to Virgie. She couldn't afford to go to Virgie. So she went to Lamika's for 250 And it was just so great to be like, you didn't go to Virgie to get her? She's like, nah, girl, why would I go there when I can go to Lamika's for 250 I got this on sale. And that's the reason. Like, the person that got the thing at a budget is the person who was not possessed by the hair, which I thought was great. Yeah, so going back to Virgie's, the whole, the whole sort of like main plot is Virgie is getting this hair that's been taken from sort of like blood soaked moss tree down south. And she's getting this weave from there. 
and giving it to people throughout LA and also giving them this like pigment where at the end of the story you find out it's just pig's blood so you have to like feed the hair mm. like pig's, pig's blood and so it's like a lotion right but that scene where Virgie <laughs> sews in Ooh, uh, the weave the sew-ins yes has these like close up shots of the scalp where the needle like accidentally punctures the scalp and there's like this little blood and there's this like Again, like this cackle, crackle. It, it is absolutely cringeworthy, and uh, I, this is this is really disturbing body horror. And it was absolutely fantastic. And and as that was going on, I, I know Amber, you were like, you're like, oh my my sister is you know tender headed. I'm not, and you were, uh, and, it, and it just started this conversation as, as we were did. watching it. It did. We'll see. So I mean, every black girl with thicker hair, like four A through D, uh, which is different types of hair textures, we so related with this movie because the opening scene so related. Like so in boy, so. back up. Let, let me speak on this because you don't know nothing about this. The movie opened with Anna, the main character, getting a relaxer or a perm from her sister, who is like lighter skinned and has silkier hair. And then the perm goes awry, and her scalp is burned and forever like damaged. I I think all of these scenes of like black people doing hair in their homes and getting so ins that so perfectly captured the story of like every black girl because we all you know a a good chunk of us got those like just for me relaxer kits and I think a lot of people think that black you know people don't believe black women when we share things and share stories of pain so I think this movie perfectly captured like yes that is exactly how it feels I remember looking down at Ben watching and I get this so in and he was like oh oh my god like they did such a great job filming her getting that so in and I remember being like yes you should feel that pain because that's how it feels. Like Ben looked up at me and was like, is this how sewing actually feels? I was like, yes. And when they first came out, everybody was getting them and you braid your hair up, you sew the hair to that braided hair. And then the rest of the day you are in pain. You're lucky if you like took medicine before I told him like, sometimes you just take Tylenol before, but it does like the first week or couple of days of you having a sew in. It is that painful. You know, people like to make fun of black girls on the like patch or weave front. But now I think that this movie was like, See, this is why we have to pat it because it's just that painful. Job well done filming, capturing that. And Justin Simeon is like obviously having this conversation with like Chris Rock's film, Good Hair. And there's a scene in Justin Simeon's uh, Dear, uh, Dear White People where this white character asks a black character, Oh, is that a weave? And, mm. she, and she's like, She's like, Oh, I've seen good hair. And that's, and so. The white character feels that she knows mm-hmm. about black like, hair. I'm justified to ask you about your hair because I, I did I, my homework here. And, and watched Good Hair. And it just made me think about how that movie sort of became like the movie about black hair. Where there's so much complexity and so many other stories that involve yeah. like telling about this, this part of like not only like black women culture but black hair is in an entire yeah. different realm yeah so there needs to be like more there's so many more stories to like explore so many more films to be made like talking about these issues but the main the main issue that this story is dealing with is this idea of like you having to change yourself mm-hmm. this proximity to yeah. whiteness yeah so so anna anna changes her hair and she's getting all this new attention and she loves it um, she gets a promotion at work. She she does get a promotion, but she, at one point she goes back to her old boss and she has a conversation with her old boss. And the this yes, there's like the killer weave, but that's not the true horror of the film, like any sort of horror film. The true horror is, is this idea that you have to change yourself to fit in. And 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 so I could sort of see someone like getting pissed off at this movie and saying, you know, this is showing that people who get uh, weaves have like sold out. Yeah, I think this movie did a great job addressing all of that because there was so her former boss, Edna, and for context, her new boss is 
played by Vanessa Williams, who you know Miss Vanessa Williams. She's a former pageant queen. She's an actress. We we've we've seen her in many things. We love her, but she's very light skinned, and she is the driving force behind like everybody should go to Virgie's and get new long silky hair. This is the new wave. She even changes the name of culture to just cult, which I think worked perfectly well and so her former boss Edna is great uh, she's she's darker skinned woman she has like sister locks and so she's one day they end up in the same hair salon together and in this hair salon Anna is not at Burgie's Anna is trying to get her uh weave taken out of her head and when she's in that salon her old boss Edna walks in and is like oh well you've changed blah 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 and she's like yeah I I don't think it's for the better I don't know what I want so the the stylist is starting to cut her hair out of her head and and Edna says to Anna, Edna, the former boss, says, you know, it looks really good on you. And one day there's a world where we can all wear hair the, exactly the way we want to. So I think that for me was the reconciling that conversation. There is a huge, you know, conversation and controversy in the the black community about like, well, those of you with natural hair have embraced your natural curl pattern and those with you with who still wearing extensions aren't as woke or are as conscious. And I think like, that's just not true. We should all get to wear our hair as we want. Uh, but I think this movie did a good job sort of reconciling both because Anna didn't change her hair because she wanted to. That's what it's about. It's like, did I want to do this or was I told if you do this, you'll get more opportunities that, for me, is the distinction here. All right. There are two things I want to say about that. One, it was only last year that a legislation was passed, and I think just in California, called the Crown Act, mm -hmm. which makes it illegal for you to discriminate specifically against your hairstyle. Right. And that's new, and that just happened 2019, right? So this issue is, like, still um a a serious issue that people face i remember i was watching like a video of this wrestler who who had his locks cut. oh yeah i remember that remember that because he's like yeah you can't play with these locks that that's what it is yeah and so but but also in that same scene uh the weave takes over and that sort of like um uh, and that let in sort of the 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 natural um hair salon and kills everybody in the hair salon yes like really brutally and as you watch this, just a warning, the body count is fucking high. A lot of people die in this movie. Yep. And let's just talk about some of our favorite deaths. Yes! Oh, well, you already know. You already know that the landlord death was my absolute fave. Well, the end, how she got rid of the body, I think, was your oh, favorite. Oh, man. This, her landlord, who is uh, raising the rent due to gentrification, and also just a sleazy rapist. So he's going around just, like, knocking on people's doors, drunk, and opening the door, and just forcing himself on women. Uh, the hair ends up killing him in an awesome way. It's sucking up all his blood. And then Anna throws him out of her window <laughs> into a trash can. He is... And, and we're not talking about, like, two stories. We're talking about, like, 30th floor situation. So just watching this man get tumbled out the window was just, like, the chef's kiss on this whole horror scene. Oh, my God. Wasn't that one so good? Yeah. And, and the whole film is sort of shot in this, like, grainy VHS type of way. So it makes you think of, like, these, you know, 1980s slasher films. That, that ending uh, death is great. Another one that was awesome is she, she's she been, like, seeing this guy, uh, played by Jerry Farrell, Julius. Anna and Julius started working at Culture at the same time, but Julius moved up, like, way quicker, and he got his own series, his own show. So there's this, like, intersectionality where they're both black, but since he's a black man... He mm -hmm. was able to. And he was up. a receptionist. He wasn't he, even there, like on the creative team. Exactly. Yeah. No and shade to receptionists. No, not at all. But uh, so he, Julius, and Anna have been like seeing each other on the DL, and <laughs> was that your slang? No, go ahead, keep going. On the yeah, it stands for down low. Right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I didn't know that. Point being. <laughs> Uh, mm. Julius and Anna have been fooling around, but then Julius, you know, you know, pushes her to the side until he sees Anna with like the new weave and like mm -hmm. moving up. And so they end up like having sex and coming back. But then 
the thing that we didn't say about this like weave is that it also like can take over your body as mm-hmm. well. And and it's done by like giving you these green it's like eyes. yellowish contacts. Yeah, <laughs> these yellowish contacts. And then she as they're having sex, like she brutally murders yeah. her, her with like stabbing him and <laughs> They show everything, like the puncture marks of the broken wine glass. So that death was... And then the weave sucks up all the blood. Yeah, which I I, I sort of hate how like violence and sex are so often juxtaposed in, in films. Hmm. Uh, because I think it sort of teaches viewers to associate violence and sex. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, that's, maybe there's something there. I mean, it's a horror film, so I'm trying to... I, I think we've seen sex in so many different ways in film, just, like, from rom-coms to horror. So, yeah. yeah. Perhaps. So, that Julius dies quickly. Everyone in... And she kills her her old boss, Edna. And then, finally, we didn't mention Zora's death. Played by Vanessa Williams. Yeah, yeah. So, Zora has also dies she dies through like being hung but then like the body the weave takes over her and so um zora and anna sort of have this like weave battle yeah hair is like flowing that's a thing there are legit i mean you might not know this but there are like hair shows and huge hair battles there used to be a whole show on oxygen that was like hair weave battles where people would like launch helicopters off people's weaves I i gotta show you that later oh shit Full ass hair battles and hair sh- like Bronner Brothers does hair shows all the time. So I, I love that there was a, a full weave battle. Like how many bundles of weave went into making this film? I love, love, loved it. I got, I'm gonna show you some videos. I think a, mo- a lot of it sort of went back and forth between like CGI weave and like real weave. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a lot of real weave in the building. Yeah, no, for for sure. And so I I appreciated all of that. I mean, I never thought I would be in the bathroom with you talking about weave at length. This is great. Yeah, I think again, like I hope we get to see more like weave horror, heart stories that weave in hair, heart horror store, horror. hair, hair, hair. This is horror, a new genre. <laughs> I'm here, please, please. I need a moment in this genre because I look amazing in some braids. You know, I'm growing out my middle, so I can get me some braids whenever I'm allowed to go yeah. back outside. You know. Well, yeah. I don't know if that will ever happen. Right. Well, I'm gonna get some braids for the house, and you love them. Mm-hmm. You love when I get me some braids, don't you? Yeah. I I You're love not at liberty I to love say. I love everything that you do with my hair with your hair. I mean, you know, one time I you know I I had a white roommate, a white male roommate before we lived together, and he watched me. This was when I was wearing weave at the time. I don't wear weave now much, be, uh, truly, because I just sweat so much because of the yoga that I do. It would come out at the time. I wasn't doing yoga, and so Jason watched me do my weave for like a full two hours on a Saturday, and he was like. I just watched you do that, and now I totally understand why black women do not want anyone touching their hair or getting their hair wet or whatever. He's like, I have a new appreciation after watching how long it took you to do that. He was like, I don't know if I've ever touched your hair before, but I will never, ever, because I, I just, it, it's it's like watching an artist paint a canvas, paint on a canvas for hours, and then being like, oh, I'm going to touch the art. It's like, no, 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 no. It, like, he truly just had a... a an epiphany in that moment because he didn't even know that I was wearing weave until I was just like sitting in front of I think we were just watching like drag race and I was gluing it in like track by track and he was like oh shit this is a lot and this is just like what I was doing was a a, a lower you know cook and prep time than some things the last thing I want to talk about is the the tension between Anna's family and Anna's decision to go into TV. And so Anna Anna comes from a family where she's raised by her aunt and uncle and her uncle played by the great Blair Underwood is a college professor, a folklorist and then her cousin, cousin sister is a teacher. Her uncle the professor gives her a tale of books and I think the title is called Slave Tales and it 
is this book that ends up saving Anna or helping Anna learn about this destructive killer monster that has taken over her body and her head. I mean, I love that because I think there's this tension between, especially, and I'm not sure, I can't speak to other communities, but in the black community, there, there's this tension between millennials and the older generation. And I know I get into that with my mom. She's like, I'm so frustrated with millennials because y'all just think y'all know everything and things like that. And we were having this conversation last night about how much I gain from these talks with my mother because she just knows me so intimately better than anybody in the world and how it's important to always come back to that no matter how much we know or we think we know it's it's important to hear those stories of our elders because they are what keeps us like grounded and and safe essentially sometimes you know we all have problematic aunties and all of that but I think the the things that my mother had to do to become a fully realized woman and adult are still some of the tools that I need right now, even though I'm a well-read millennial and all of those things. So I really enjoyed that part of it. I also enjoyed seeing Blair Underwear for the first time ever, not as like the problematic black male in the film. I know he's like, Blair Underwood is infamous for just playing like the black man that abuses you in a movie or the black man that cheats on you or the black man that gave you an STD. So it was really refreshing to be like, oh God, here's Blair Underwood. What's going to happen? And I don't, and I don't say that, I don't say that to say Blair Underwood doesn't have the range, but that is truly how we've seen him. If you see Blair Underwear on that IMDB page. Underwear? Yes. <laughs> Blair what? Underwear. How long have I been saying Blair Underwear? You said it twice. Okay. If you see Blair Underwood on that casting call, you know somebody's getting cheated on, somebody's getting murdered. But it was nice to see him as a a professor of African American studies just as a full, like, you know, poster child for academia. It was really great to see him. It, and also, I mean, this goes without saying, but all of the hair was really well done in the movies. Sometimes, again, we will watch black films, going back to those Tyler Perry movies, we'll watch black films where we know, like, a black person did not do this because this is, or a black person poorly did this because this hair is is really, really bad. These wigs are horrible. But this, I mean, Blair Underwood was looking good. He was looking like a silver fox. He had, like, the the new fresh fades. It was It was a whole snack. This whole cast had really well done weaves, extensions, natural styles. It was, it was, mm, chef's kiss. I love this movie so much. I'm so mad. What did he get on Rotten Tomatoes? It was like 65% or 62%. Uh, oh, I mean, there were some parts that dragged, but I think it was worth at least, for me, a 80. I want to see this similar to Dear White People. I want to see this turn into a TV show because there are, there's like this overall, like the white man who's actually producing the weave and bringing it into the city. So there's, which is not really relevant. They show it very quickly at the end of the film. And there are a lot of different characters in this. Like, for example, this is the uh, character Sista, which is uh, basically mm-hmm. Anna. Ha- Sister Soul. Yeah, Sister Soul. Uh, like, Anna has two really good friends at. Take that black box. At, at a culture. character called Sister Soul. <laughs> And uh, Anna has two really good friends at uh, Culture, and the three of them sort of stick together. And we don't see a lot of their relationship. There's some banter here and there, but we could have definitely seen more of that relationship develop because there is so many ideas, right? It deals with, like, workplace uh, harassment or workplace. It's those dynamics. There's There's so many different things that go on in this film. Uh, that it, it could have been extended out for like a whole fun, mm-hmm. fun, campy TV show. I remember you saying it felt like a pilot to a TV series. I would, I would love to see this turned into a TV series or I was all in for it. I, I don't know what the critics were talking about. I think maybe it's just because they didn't understand the complexities of black hair and how black hair and how weave and extensions can feel like a burden sometimes and a monster sometimes that's like taking over you and this pressure to assimilate. It, I, I think it just wrapped that all in a bow. All right, Ben. Well, I think the time has come for you to warp up. Give me a nice weavy warp up to the show. 
All right. In conclusion, there is no better way to end your October scare season with bad hair. Go On watch Hulu. it. Go watch it, and then go ahead and like write a review on Rotten Tomatoes. Let's like you know get some positive reviews. Except I think they got rid of the audience reviews. Anyway, start your own blog and become a professional reviewer, so that can be aggregated into the overall review score of the Rotten Tomatoes. Come on, aggregate. Yes. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the Sci Fi Sci. Next week, we're out of spooky season, so we're going to get back into our, our reading. We will be reading the complete Binti trilogy by Nettie Akorafor. And we know our girl Nettie. She's won the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, and the World Fantasy Award, all the awards. So, so, so excited to get into this book. So if you would like to join us, please pick up your copy of Binti, the complete trilogy, and we will see y'all next time for the discussion. Bye, y'all.